Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, our uh, webinar series. Today we have um, Deborah Pardis and uh, Jared Feschler. Um, we're going to talk about the um, collaboration between arresting knowledge that Deborah is going to talk about and tribe worthy that Jared is going to talk about, and seeing how we can use that in our daily life and especially the media educators, how both initiative can help us with looking at uh, all the information that we're having um, in the media saturated environment that we live in. So I will leave it to uh, Deborah and Jared to take it from here and um, talk to us about their initiatives. Wonderful. Um, first of all, uh, thank you guys for including us in this, in this ongoing conversation. I've watched a lot of your uh, seminars and videos uh, on, on your YouTube channel. And uh, it's such a, a, an amazing amount of information. I think that's one of the themes of, of, of today's uh, webinar. I think Jared will join me in saying that there are so many smart people around this issue. There are so many smart tools and the excitement of operationalizing those tools and sending them out into the world to actually be useful is a passion of, of both of ours. Um, and it's, but it starts with pure knowledge and pure understanding. And that's where the academic world is so important, where it's, it's concentrated, it's distilled down to very, very teachable moments. And then when everyone becomes empowered, what do we do then? How do we take it out to the streets and make change in the world? So the theme today really is, um, as, as Jared so aptly puts it, it's not a spectator sport. We, we can't watch the world pass by us. Um, we have to get involved in, in the creation of media and the understanding of media. Um, and there's so many red flags right now, and I know that everyone on this call knows what they are, so we can skip all of that. And what I really want to get back to uh, in, in, in the conversation for the next hour is, is tactical, tactical behaviors that we all can take. Um, I'm going to share my screen just for two seconds, just to show you a, a thought process of today's... Um, uh, can you see this? Can you see my, is, how does it work? I just click on something. You need to click on, there is like a green arrow. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Can you see this? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is just, the, this is, we're just going to show this one. So it's, I want to do an icebreaker actually really quickly about one question. Uh, and then it just introductions about my background and Jared's background and then go over sort of a manifesto that I'm calling the Aristing Knowledge Manifesto, but it's more appropriately the manifesto that we're, we can all live and breathe with from this webinar. Um, and then a commitment that we're gonna make to each other about it, an intergenerational event before June, 2018. Um, so let's go back to um, uh, the stop share so you can see my face again. Um, the icebreaker I wanted to, to have today uh, with all of you who, who joined us is, um, to say your name and to, and to mention one thing that you've discovered, whether it's online or offline, that has brought joy to you in terms of bringing more clarity. Uh, a tool you've discovered that you're using, like when I discovered Twiberthy, I was excited. Um, like, is there a tool, one tool you could say, well, I discovered this, I shared this, I found this, and it helps me um, make better sense of the world I'm living in. It doesn't have to necessarily be a news literacy tool or a media literacy tool, but I love hearing people's discoveries. We're living in a total media saturated world, not just media like news media, but, but actual widgets. So it's always interesting to know. So I'll start. Uh, I'm Deborah, and uh, I, um, I actually have discovered Procon.org, and I'm actually working with them as a consultant, but I have to tell you, it's changed, it's changed my life. Um, Procon.org gives you pro and con arguments on both sides, and there are very, um, it's a very good tool because they spend so much time on issues. They cite really sources beautifully. You, you can actually click a button and cite their source. Um, and it's just helped me understand the feelings behind, the facts behind my feelings about issues, and it's helped me look at other people's uh, reasons behind their feelings. And it's a pretty powerful product that they have built for journalists and educators, but I'm tasked to help it become every man's tool. That's a large ask, so that's my, my job. So that's, that's me. Who, who next? I'll so, go ahead and, uh, and knock one out of here real quick. Um, actually, Deborah, it's pretty similar to yours. Um, Pro versus con, I think I've also seen red versus blue. Um, 
and of course keeping up with as many of these organizations as possible another one to add to the list is allsides.com yes wonderful um which i think is a very interesting platform um mainly because it keeps it within the polarized atmosphere of this left versus right or central, but at least it gives you those at three perspectives. So if you're a natural news consumer going about your daily tasks, you would have to go to X outlet to find your perspective anyways, and a lot of people end up reading multiple news outlets on the same topic to create their own opinion. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, a unique tool. I don't think it's the right tool but it is one that I've used before. Interesting, great. All right, I'm gonna go all old school on you guys because uh, I'm not gonna talk about a digital tool, but in fact, a, a TV series. Uh, and no, it's not Adam Ruins Everything, which is awesome, please watch it. Um, but the one I'm watching right now is called The History of Comedy. It's a CNN a special, and I just finished watching a really great episode on parody and satire. I've been thinking a lot about parody and satire as forms of propaganda that might be beneficial nice. or harmful. And there is something really powerful about seeing uh, a historical look at uh, parody and satire from the, from the 20th, from the late 20th century, from the last 50 years of the 20th century, uh, and then moving forward. And I, I feel, um, I feel like somehow, maybe as I get older, I get more interested in how looking historically can often give us a little bit of critical distance that we need when it comes yeah. to understanding some of these forms. Uh, uh, Renee, where is um, History of Comedy on what channel? Hold on. You're off, you're muted. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. It's a CNN. It's a CNN uh, documentary. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I can go next. Um, I was um, uh, helping a friend who is doing uh, mindfulness exercises um, to work on a promotional video with a student of mine, and he had a really great exercise. And the exercise was you put your phone um, in front of you, when um, the phone is completely closed and you look at it and you think which app you actually going to go on it and then you open the phone and you think like okay which app do you want to press on and you think which app is the one that you're like really most stressed about that you didn't answer and kind of like which emails from who are you so you actually look at your phone but you don't do anything with it but you have a mindfulness focusing on where are your like um kind of excitement about or stressed about and kind of trying to see beyond the technology into like how it's relate to you and where you stand in it so that was a really powerful tool for me to see oh wow i'm really stressed about this email that i think about or this app like twitter i want to see what happened here and there in the news and actually i can put it away for a second and breathe and reflect on that that's wonderful it, that, that's a that's a tool that like 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 uh renee said it's like uh it's a tool that you don't need anything but mindfulness for Who else? Troy? Yeah, I can jump in real fast. So the thing that's kind of caught my attention since I last had deep conversations with all of you last summer uh, is the work of Sam Weinberg in the Stanford History Education Group. I came across his work um, originally through an open source textbook that was produced by, um, oh gosh, who was the person that wrote it? Oh. Michael Caulfield uh, about uh, like fake news and fact checking, but this idea of reading laterally and then he references Sam uh, Weinberg. So I've just been interested in looking at the work that the history education group is uh, putting out there and especially mm -hmm. this idea of reading laterally as we think about what it means to be a close and critical reader in today's age and um, you know what the common core might implore us to do. Um, staying within the boundaries of a text. This is in fact, encouraging us to move beyond the boundaries of a text. 
And, and so is I'm reading sorry. laterally, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the phrase, is, is that a kind of working phrase in, in your industry? As, as a uh, Well, it's fairly new to me. I, I had only run across it recently. I don't know when the first uh, publication of it was. Maybe Renee or someone else has some insight into it. But it actually came up when I was interfacing with Jared earlier this summer about all sides and this notion that you can open things up in multiple tabs. But then mm -hmm. I think the way that it's originally proposed is not necessarily going off of one site, like all sides or ProCon or something like that. But when you just do a search and you come up with your first, you know, 10 hits, you open all of them in tabs and then you read those tabs. So before you choose one and make that your, you know, single source, you, you go and you read laterally uh, by opening mm. multiple tabs. That's <laughs> So I'll go next. Um, I, this brings me back, kind of tying into what Troy was saying as well, um, to Howard Rheingold when he came to speak with us at the Summer Institute in Digital Literacy. He mm -hmm. was talking about his book, um, it was called NetSmart, which we all received a copy of at the conference, and we talked with him at dinner as well. And I love the way, the way that he speaks about triangulating your sources, making sure that we check our sources, that we analyze, critically analyze our sources, and how he uses the word crap detection or the term crap detection. I think about that with my students in middle school. They love that term when you say, hey, don't forget about your crap detection. But then pairing that with um, the media literacy remote that Renee Hobbs created, I love using that with my classes as well, Renee, and saying to them, now that you know you've got to be mindful of your crap detection, let's use this tool to analyze the sources and ask these critical questions while we're looking at the media. So don't just absorb the media, don't just sit there and be passive and let it happen to you. Analyze and then create your own, but analyze what's there first. And I think those are great tools together. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we have some people without faces, but are equally important. How about... Um, well, I'll hop in um, next. Um, uh, so I was sitting in the dentist office today and took my own New Yorker with me and saw this ad for um, texture. Have you seen it? Mm -mm. It's uh, the headline is it's time to reunite around the truth. And it um, looks like it's an app. Uh, Texture.com or a website. I'm not even sure. But it's um, 200 of the most reputable magazines in one app. It is an app. Wow. Which I thought was pretty cool that um, news magazines uh, are from all stripes. I mean, Mother Jones is here and Time is here and The Atlantic is here. Uh, the New Yorker is here. Um, are, you know, realizing or wanting to make a distinction between news that actually does some um, journalistic process and some others that don't and um, uniting in that way. I loved it. You know, Pam, that's, that's really cool. I'm glad that you found that. Um, just recently, we did a talk with uh, Patrick Lee, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and I love the picture on the back of that magazine because he was talking about how every news organization and article written about a specific topic is, is almost exactly like what Rotten Tomatoes was doing. So people would go and watch a movie and then they'd be the critique about Great. and write about the movie. Exactly. Wow. This is the same thing. The magazines and the news outlets are writing their critique about the particular topic that's going yeah. on. So it's, yeah. it's cool to see that magazines are coming together like that. Yeah. And, and Tribe Worthy is very much looking at that model as well, the, the, the rotten tomato culture to help vet your articles, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I would be more than happy to dive into that. <laughs> we'll we'll let's, keep this going a little no, bit let's longer. Let's do that. Let, let's, let, let's, we have Nikita and Zoe and um, B. Barbara, something. I'll jump in. B. F. Lehman is Barbara. Hi, Hi Barbara. All. Um, Hi, Barbara. I'm really I'm particularly, in hi Renee, how are you? Um, I'm particularly interested in, in visual literacy, in that component of media literacy. So one of the things I really love looking at is um, the Washington Post section where they do the photographs of the week and they discuss those. I, I think it's um, 
it's it's a really important component that that from my point of view, visual literacy kind of gets lost in media literacy mm -hmm. discussion, and it, it really needs to be brought to the fore. There's a whole there's a whole component of being able to deal with the visual and understanding uh, the kind of impact that has. So that's that's my that's opinion. that's so interesting. Did you find the you know people think about visual literacy and then they jump to the believability of actual visuals because of Photoshop? Is that something that comes into that narrative when people are talking about the, the images? Um, it can come into it. Um, I, I've spent my, my professional life as a graphic designer. Um, and then I went back to UCLA a couple of years ago and uh, got a master's in uh, uh, the Graduate School of Education, studying with Douglas Kellner and uh, focused on, on the visual literacy component. There's, there's mm -hmm. so many pieces to it, um, but, but yes, that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's the one that you just mentioned, the Washington Post as a, as a place where they do that as an active forum? They do, they do, which great. I find very, very interesting. Yeah. That's so great. And uh, Nikita uh, has a loud area that she's in, but she, she texted all of us and she, um, we're reading. Is that okay, Nikita? We're just going to read what you, what you wrote uh, about the Atlantic. Uh, it talks about how WikiLeaks asked Donald Trump to leak some of Trump's tax returns to create an illusion of being unbiased. It shows me even raw information can be published in a way that makes it essentially propaganda. Um, I have to look at that. That's great. Uh, you know, it's interesting to bring up WikiLeaks. It's such a. a um, divisive conversation, <laughs> especially with people leaning left around um, wanting things to flow both ways and it's just, it's never gonna end. So um, I wouldn't know where to begin on that one. Um, Zoe, do you wanna share something that you've, you've um, found in the world that is helpful to you as a tool or a phenomenon that makes sense to you to make sense of the world? Sure. Um, I'm have to go. Um, I'm gonna have to go uh, old school as well. Um, since I am hey. <laughs> a nerd, uh, so I f I feel like I have to talk about YouTube. So I think YouTube is a, a, a very useful tool, um, not only to finding sources and finding. Uh, you know, different perspectives of certain topics, but also a um, empowers people to, um, you know, make simple videos to make your own voice heard. So, um, so I mean, there can be um, a lot of like other um, uh, aspects about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but but yes, that basically um, that could be a very uh, useful tool. Um, yeah. So um, when talking about YouTube and you know the system of YouTube. Teachers can also use that as a tool to analyze, um, you know, how YouTube as a media system uh, works differently um, or the same uh, compared to traditional media. Mm -hmm. I saw your workshop. Didn't you do a workshop on YouTube? It was yeah. lovely. It was great. I, I, took, I took notes on that, in fact. You had some really interesting statistics. Oh, thank you. Hey, Zoe, have like you... Yeah. Have you checked out uh, narrative.ly narratively? If you like the YouTube channel for that kind of information, I would highly recommend checking them out. I think they just went through a Kickstarter campaign, so they might be live. I'm pretty sure they're live, but I would I would check them out. Narrative.ly. That All right, I'll put Thank that on you. the list. Awesome. Thank you very much. Jared, uh, would you want to jump in here and um, talk about where you are right now with Thrive Worthy and, and some of your exciting news and some of your frustrations and where you... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I would. <laughs> well, it, some of you missed out, but I had a lot of things going on all at the same time. Um, we were, of course, in conversations with Deborah and talking about creating... Um, some sort of partnership or um, community, et cetera. Um, I just got married, so that was one thing checked off my list. So that's good to go. And then Triworthy just completed its um, 
final tests for its website um, in which we proved a couple things. A, that people will go through our review process. B, that the review process actually generated um, accurate, trustworthy percentage ratings for these articles. Um, and then that the user reviews were um, logical and reasonable and not like a comment section, which is a huge jump for us as well. Um, however, we also found out that our website is not the means to um, generate extended growth through. So for those, I mean, most of you've heard or seen me before and heard of Triworthy, maybe checked it out. Um, essentially what we are is an online platform for news consumers to read, review, and build trust in online news. So people go to the articles, review the article through our platform, and it creates a trust rating percentage around that. So um, I would say that's the gist of it. We're looking at funding right now, and that's kind of why we've had our heads down here for the, it feels like the last two or three months, um, and that haven't been doing too much promotion. Um, but that's about to come to an end here as something I was going to mention at the very end, but we will be doing a Kickstarter campaign ourselves in probably late January. So I hope to reach out to all you guys at that time again. Um, I have some questions for the group today, but Deborah, did you have everything off your plate? Um, or at least for now? Uh, yeah, we you know what I have. I have a definitely uh, I want to go through some questions, but I, you're in a flow, so let's let's stay with you. Sweet, perfect. <laughs> um, so, really, just three questions. I think these can be rapid fire for everyone that's using video. You can just give me like a quick thumbs up, and then record your answer. Um, the first question is a general question. I think I know all of your answers, but how many of you are fed up with the current news climate in some fashion or another? I think that was 100% golden. <laughs> I'm setting this up. Uh, the, the second would be, how many of you use media, media literacy skills on a daily basis to help filter or decipher the news that you read? Awesome, I'm batting 100. Uh, how many of you are friends with media literacy educators or advocates from a different organization and or school? Basically, the reason why I love this, this whole thing, this, this webinar, the people that are on here, and, and the title for this, that media is no longer a spectator sport, is because we have nearly everything that we are set up for to move this from our individual selves and our teachings to a local, a regional, or a national idea. And I know this is what Deborah's kind of teeing up for and and that's what we talked a lot about in our potential partnership or our community um uh renee you put on a, a model or you created the model acra i got it here i think uh, uh elizavita if i'm saying her name correctly uh did a little webinar on it um uh, just last month in which you have the five steps access evaluate and analyze create, reflect, and act. That is five, perfect. Um, and, and Elizaveta talked about how maybe the reflection piece and the action piece is maybe the lackluster component uh, or just a component in which we need to focus on a little bit more. And I think that's, that's huge because based on those questions that you guys all just answered with your thumbs up, we know that we're not alone in this fight against misinformation and disinformation. Um, we have access to all the news, whether through our mobile devices, desktop, tablet, on the go, at home, wherever you want to get it. Um, we also know that we have the knowledge to evaluate and analyze the news, and we do that in a daily basis. Uh, so really the last thing that we need as a group to focus on is bringing all of our efforts into one form and finding the tool in which we can use that to break this thing open. So I, the biggest question I have at the end of this is, is why don't we do that? Why aren't we doing that now?
Okay, so everybody has a different answer to that, but I, I put my answer to that in the, uh, in the chat. So when it comes to reflection and access, analyze and create are definitely practices that can happen in every public school. They're well within the uh, range of what we understand as literacy practices. But reflection and action are simultaneously personal and political. Okay, and that can be very complicated in the context of public education. School teachers are public employees, they're government officials. And if they get too personal and too political, uh, well, they stand on a soapbox and rant and lose their jobs. <laughs> uh, and that's not really educational, that's not really, that does, that's not their job. So this work can be complicated because it is inevitably political and personal, um, but there are boundaries around that as in relation to certain educational contexts and public education is one of them. Is, is this a, is that true just across the board or is that age specific? Because I feel at certain age ranges, we can break apart from that um, guideline or even law is, is what you're talking about. Um, I know that there's an age restriction, at least from our company perspective and what we can promote. And I didn't know if you would be able to open that up a little bit more for me. Is it age related? Boy, that's really, I don't, I'm not sure about that. It seems much more context specific. Like in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the context of how a teacher can be personal and political is different than how a teacher can be personal political in Brookline, Massachusetts. So I would say it's maybe more geographic than age related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That almost seems, just off the top of my head, that almost seems uh, limiting. Because if you're, if you're focused in your geographic location, then it's just your surroundings that forces you to abide by the certain political side or party or line for what your area is in and not necessarily what's for the betterment. Hmm. I think there's also the difference between the age related between the higher education. So if you're talking about undergraduate, graduate education and K-12, that's very different um, in that sense. There is like the academic freedom that kind of gives the professor more, even as a state employee, to express their political views versus the teacher or the librarian or anybody in the school that are more refined from uh, adding this political and personal perspective. Yeah, good point. But we could do, a, can you give a thumbs up if you've heard about a teacher who's kind of afraid to address certain topics in the news because they're concerned about a backlash? Anybody met a teacher like that? Look at the hands up on that. Woo! Yeah. Dozens. I mean, you know, the other thing to think about too is that even teachers who do have protection of tenure and organized labor are increasingly coming under attack. And even if they do feel that they have those protections, they walk this untenable line, like you said, Renee, you know, teaching for social justice and equity and things like that are inherently political acts in an inherently political space. Um, and it was not an accident that, you know, Trump started calling them government schools. Um, that was a very intentional red flag signal to lots of people. So, um, and of course we got Betsy DeVos, which Michigan knows all about. That's a whole other webinar, but my point right. to answer Jared's question is that as much as I would like, I, I mean, there are teachers that I know that are going to speak their mind and do what they want and put up the fight every day. Um, but I, I think that's a hard load to put on the shoulders. Uh, uh, and I only say average, not in a pejorative sense, but just in a sense that teachers on average are dealing with a hell of a lot every day on top of being political actors. And so that is really, really a heavy load to lift. Um, I don't know uh, if that makes any Troy, sense. I would, I would ask you, maybe in, in your personal opinion, what other topics could be explored that wouldn't be so aligned with the political? Because I, I understand, I get that 
you know, personal reasons and yeah. job reasons, you might not want to talk about anything political. Is there something on the economic or business side or, or, or just a different complete category that we can still use the media literacy tools that we have to help teach the students or even ourselves? Yeah. So I, 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 th I think, sorry, go ahead, Troy, continue your thought. Well, I was just going to say, I'd go back to what Renee said just a moment ago to answer that. I think that asking students to analyze and critique and even to parody and to reflect and do those things are all within the realm of a, you know, typical English language arts class. And so long as you're doing media literacy with a feminist lens or you're doing media literacy with a Marxist lens and you're connecting it to literature and you're, you're doing it within those kind of four square walls of English class and it doesn't it's not really going to bleed out into the real world and it's certainly not going to have kids go home and question their parents and maybe what their parents do for a living and who they vote for then that's okay but as soon as it crosses that line that's when it gets problematic I see I see mm. super frustrating I mean I think that part of uh I think Renee and I talked about this last summer, that inter intergenerational uh, conversation, the, the, the context of a classroom where you're safe to be rigorous and around your critical thinking, especially let's say Triworthy shows up in a classroom and they're looking at a particular article and they're, they're saying, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out how they would behave around that with the social prompts that Triworthy provides for you. And they discover that they're able to actually unpack something and see that it's a pretty faulty article to come home to their parents and share the excitement of that revelation can land them in, in the, in the, in the shitter, excuse me, expression. I mean, that's the problem and the challenge. And I think that one of the things that confounds me as someone who doesn't work inside the classroom and works more with adults is where's the opportunity um, for teachers to not get in trouble, but to, sort of encourage the, the, the hero's journey in that child themselves. Like, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna be in this little journey of, of, of understanding the world is not fair and that there are people that are lying. And it doesn't mean they have to get completely messy all of a sudden and explode onto, their, onto the rest of the universe. But I think one of the nice things about Tribe Worthy is you don't, you don't even have to rate your own article. You can kind of go through and see how people are really thinking around articles and not even participate and get excited about that process. Um, and that's a way out of this to say that let's just consume tribe worthy as a as a feed for a second just to follow how people are discerning whether or not this is this is something we should think about as 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 being filled with some some artifacts inside the inside the, the, the article itself. Um, I think Deborah, but, it's it's part of what also um, Elisaveta was talking about the the problem in the polarized um, world that we live in is that whatever opinion you like share suddenly you'll have other people that will bash your opinion instead of really listening and seeing like where is it coming from so the example of the kids that would come at home and again it depends on what kind of practices of real reflection you're having and deep discussion because if they're coming and saying oh this like uh news is fake news, it's a completely wrong, and the parents have a complete opposite opinion, it's not about listening, it's the kids are coming and bashing their parents, and so the yeah. parents will fight back. Instead of having a real discussion about the opinion, where it comes from, and real media literacy inquiry about the constructs and where it comes mm -hmm. from, and what kind of emotion and gratification it gives you as a parent, as a child, and how it works. Yeah. So I think it's really complex in that sense of having the teachers having a real accepting and deep listening and active listening of different and opposite opinions. Mm -hmm. I think you hit on a point where the emotional landscape of somebody who goes into conflict is really a consideration. Um, a lot of people uh, don't want to have conflict, period. So they, they kind of atrophy a little bit. And when they discover something it's a private moment and like Renee said it's very but the personal is political these days so it's really hard to to navigate the decisions you have to make on a daily basis about who to speak to and who not to speak to but in social feeds as Nikita brings up she's that's where she's active 
you know, she's doing her, her, her media literacy goodness on social, social feeds. And how, how do you spread that out at a, at a more strategic macro level? Um, which brings me actually to uh, something I want to share with all of you and kind of get your feedback on. Um, hold on, I'm reading Pamela's note here. Sorry. Uh, doesn't all processes of critical thinking take us into the same scary territory between young adults and parents? Yeah. I mean, you know, the holiday season is bringing up a lot of things for people because you have um, extended families coming and behaviors are really different uh, when you're just with your nuclear family. And um, there's been a lot of campaigns by a lot of people talking about how do you behave? How do you get crazy Uncle Sam to not talk about that right now? Or if he does talk about that, how do you not fight and throw food? And it's scary for people. Um, and I want to talk about that fear for a second. Um, because this summer when I was talking with people at, during the Arresting Knowledge Tour, um, some things that came up to me were about um, the individual journey versus the outward journey. And I think that's a very interesting thing to talk about as educators. So when I learned something uh, and I had that fuzzy feeling inside of an epiphany, um, the journey to, to live that experience out into the real world is, is now more than ever quite an arduous journey. There's boulders of fear. Like, should I tell somebody that I discovered this and who is that somebody and how do I handle um, the, 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 the lack of harmony if that person explodes because I said something that's inflammatory to them? So there's a layer here of emotional intelligence a layer of critical conversations, a layer of how do you work with people around this heavy issue of fact, you know, fact-based living, um, with with the, with the um, with the idea of creating um, an opportunity for gentle unfolding. Uh, I think it, it comes something comes up for me around this what happened this summer, which kind of built a manifesto for me. So uh, I want to share this manifesto with you guys and see if you can, you can kind of play with me on this. So uh, I believe we're all ambassadors. Um, that's, a matter of, that's a big point for me that we, we have a um, capacity to be leaders. Um, our daily bread is one-to-one, -one, not one-to-many. So what we, what, where we live our truths is in individual conversations, not so much bullhorns, but talking to people at the bus stop and at, online at the grocery store and um, in exchanges that are very human, very um, uh, kind of old fashioned, um, but having an agenda as teachers, as media literacy advocates to, to be, be bold and bring up things. Um, I tend to do this sometimes when I'm online at a grocery store and there's a, there's a headline staring me in the face and I turn to the person next to me, I say, can you believe this? And uh, what do you feel about this headline? I actually engage people online all the time. Uh, it's, it's fun. It's really good work to do. And a lot of times people you'll meet who don't, you'll meet one of the 38 million people who think that the Inquirer is real news. Um, and it's, it's fun to engage with them. Um, I also think that part of the manifesto is discussing information versus empowerment. Um, I think a lot of, we're in an information age, but do we feel more empowered? especially now lots of us don't we feel over overwhelmed and how do we as educators uh, take take steps to make information exciting again and not divisive and, and um, disempowering um, uh, the other ma the other aspect of this is inspiring others to engage and lead um, I don't think that any of us uh, on this webinar um, would want to stand up in front of a, a crowd of a thousand people and just expect you know just be uh, uh, you know, what's that word when you're when you are extemporaneously speaking in front of people and and feel like you're confident you need to prepare but once you prepare on certain topics that are dear and near to you um, the ability to inspire others to do the same is really how we're going to ripple this um, so part of um, my passion with the resting knowledge is to find out from educators how do you t train the trainer how do you take this to a step up because we, we've got the young people that we're working with, but then we've got our peers and how do we operationalize people more? How do we get people to, to, to make this into something that's alive and kicking like a movement as opposed to an academic um, rigorous uh, uh, habit on a, uh, it, that's kind of stuck in the classroom? How do we, how do we inspire people? Which brings me to the, the, the last button in my, in my manifesto, which is 
if we're acknowledging we're ambassadors and acknowledging that we have a challenge to make information not overwhelming but but empowering kinesthetics are king for me getting people to uh, engage with each other in pairs and teams uh, we know interactive learning is, is, is powerful but adults specifically that I focus on they're never asked to get out of their chair ever and even having them stand up and move around and and become human infographics and build themselves into the into the scenario it's really super powerful um, so I feel like part of the the amazement I have around um, media literacy news literacy the study of how things are created and how things are consumed the component that I'm most passionate about is how do we constantly check in with the general public and see how they're receiving this how they're animating around it how do we engage with clergy how do we engage with community organizers and make sure that we're not stuck inside um, the box and make sure we're messy and we're in the streets and we're doing stuff um, so that's sort of the I know it's a bunch of you know lines of, 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 of ideas and bullets but the gist of this the gestalt of my work is um, how do we take everything we learn on a, on a regular basis and operationalize it in our own community so we can check in with the regular folk? And how many of you on this call, outside of the classroom, how many of you have um, had success in operationalizing and animating media literacy tools at even a micro level that you can share with us um, so that we can kind of look at the best practices of making this kind of vibrate a little bit outside of our, of our boxes? You know, it's so interesting that you are thinking that you're you're advocating it for it to be a movement, right? And what's so fascinating about how movements coalesce around a set of ideas, and yet, of course, they're still pretty diverse. So, if mm -hmm. you think about uh, the civil rights movement or the women's movement, they they coalesced around a set of ideas, but actually, there was a lot of diversity and ferment and disagreement right between mm -hmm. people in the movement right and i feel like that's probably uh that's probably going on right now in this movement right which is there are folks who are you know anti-consumerist and they're they're pissed off with the consumer society telling us how we should buy and what we should be right then there's folks who are frustrated with the social media landscape and it's the way its structures are interactors and commodifies our relationships and makes us work for free right there's like a whole lot of different different forms of discontent mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and the trick is and so i feel like if movement if thinking about media literacy as a movement is if now's a good time for that then the tricky business is kind of coalescing people to a couple of things we can all agree about mm -hmm. while respecting the fact that we're all going to have our little, I don't know, passion areas that are going to be different for different people. Mm -hmm. Right. And it kind of goes mm -hmm. back to like, can we respect each other's diverse motivations? Cause some people will care about issues of representation and bias. Right. And other people will care about accuracy and credibility and other people will, there'll be, all, it's just, yeah. It can be a little bit overwhelming. So what are the threads that connect people in this, yeah. in this way of thinking about media literacy as a movement? Well, I think that's interesting because the, the, the divisiveness is what kills all good things. When egos get involved, when people are in different camps, um, as a 17-year veteran of the adult literacy community, I stopped going to conferences after six years because there were so many people vying for, for, for that, for that you know, golden ring of this is the way we should do it. Um, I think we're in a pretty interesting time where uh, if you look at um, the power, I just look at Triborthy as, as an example of, of a place where you can live inside of some simple paradigms, some, some simple, simple, simple structures where you could say, I'm, I'm looking at a one article, I'm going to behave this way around the article. And that's sort of living in that fact, fact is king world. But I think you bring up another point, which is not so much about everybody lining to facts. It's more, more the fear that there's a, there's a, there's a um, decline of, of trust. Um, and there's a decline of, of, frankly, 
people are feeling um, overwhelmed, at least I heard this this summer, they're feeling overwhelmed that the, the Walter Cronkite era is indeed over, even if he wasn't the holder of all truth. People have this perception that somebody's in charge. And now with the globalization of information and people can access it anywhere, I think there's a crisis of faith, like who's in charge of saying what's true and what's not. And I think there's an opportunity there to say, okay, there are faith-based people who don't need facts because they just believe in faith. And there, there are also people that are wanting to, to feel that there's, a, there's leadership around the space of what's a fact and what's not. So I think as much as we don't want to have one person standing up and representing, isn't it, isn't it true that people respond to people and not to facts? I mean, that's one of my, my, my curiosities is like people respond to people. Anybody want to comment on that? We thinking? Because things that are faceless. I, 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 my, my gut reaction to that people respond to people, I had to quite literally take a deep breath because mm -hmm. I'm afraid of saying something about how the people that are garnering responses and the people who are giving the responses and I'm just going to pause there and try to think about it more. So yes, I'm thinking. Yeah. I, I, it's human nature. It's not, it's not something that makes me comfortable, by the way. Um, I think that. Not as an academic, right? Like we're supposed no, to. No, not no, that there's no. Anything I, I, such as objectivity, but just this idea. Right. That, I mean, I think, I think movements, movements uh, occur out of necessity to have shifts. And I think there's a real, I mean, most people that I speak to don't know what media literacy is, let alone that there's a group of people on a seminar right now. They don't know that conferences exist. They don't know that it's a, it's a discipline academically. Um, they do know that there's big brands out there like Facebook saying, whoops, we made a mistake, let's fix this. Um, and that there's people that have lots of money that pay for misinformation. But in terms of, um, I had several clergy come to me this summer and say to me, they are, in, they are inundated with, with congregants who are asking them, what, where do we go for, for, for information where we can, that are, is credible that we can share with our families? And um, you know, there's a fatigue around things like Thrive Worthy because people don't want to do one extra thing in their lives. You know, they're already tired of socializing. Then they get on Thrive Worthy and they've got to like, inter they've got to talk about, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult work. So Jared, from your perspective, I, I'm sure you're feeling the, you want a million people to come to your site every day, literally, to really figure out how to push back on misinformation by having people, you know, throw tomatoes at it. Um, or not? H how are you seeing this in terms of the human nature of wanting to not work so hard? <laughs> you know, this is, <laughs> I got to let out my long drawn sigh with this too, because I've been working on Triberthy for a little over a year and a half now. I think it's like 2000 hours just myself uh, banging away on this problem. And in the most recent light that we've, or not really light, but the structure in which we are framing our thoughts um, is called BMAT. B equals M-A-T. So your behavior equals your motivation, your ability, and finally your trigger. And I think for all of us, the, the motivation is, is there because we're all sick and tired of the news. There's fake news, misinformation, disinformation, satire, parody, opinion pieces, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And we can't filter that information out. So the motivation I think is there. I think where we're lacking is the ability to hold media accountable. And then finally, if we have that ability, what's our trigger to actually do that? Uh, Piece. So mm -hmm. that's how we've been we've been using that equation um, fairly recently when we look at our own platform because it really opened us up to new features and ideas and concepts that our website and our you know soon to be built browser extension uh, are lacking. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's any insight for the rest of you in your own mm -hmm. lives, but where where might we enhance the motivation, the ability, or the trigger to take media literacy out into the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you, can, you can look at the, the Yelp world a little bit. Um, the motivation for me to put a Yelp ad in is because I want to think that more people are Yelping good people 
and dissing bad people or, or clarifying that they're not a good service. But, but, but I don't, sometimes I don't feel like I'm qualified to assess an article uh, in the news. I don't feel qualified and I'm a smart lady, but I don't feel qualified. So, you know, Deb, I, my, think, I think one of the uh, biggest contributions that the librarians have made to our thinking about media literacy has come from this, um, it's the Ameri It's the college and research librarians. They've come up with a concept, of, it's like a, a big idea that I think might be useful for the activists and thus those of us in the education community to think more deeply about. They say, authority is constructed and contextual. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously people crave authority, you know, authority like makes life easier, right? Being able to trust some experts, follow the leader. This is human nature, right? But yeah. now it's getting harder to figure out which authority, whose authority, on what authority. Like you were saying, the, the clergy getting deluged by the parishioners saying, tell us what to believe, right? Because there's so many competing authorities. And so mm -hmm. I think the answer is not pick one blindly or, you know, trust, you know, trust the white man, right? It's not, we, we, it's not so simple, but I think we can all recognize how, like if you're trying to sell stuff on, on Etsy, the expert who's gonna guide you into doing that well is different than somebody who's gonna critically evaluate that piece of news about Turkey and Erdogan yeah. and blah, blah, blah. That's another kind of expert. Right? That's right. Maybe That's it's right. the idea that for different problems, you need to suss out who's the authority who can help you in that particular context. And that, to, to, to really drill down on that, we're going to have to change the way we think about teaching too, because then the idea is really helping students make those determinations. Who is the authority for when I need to solve X problem mm -hmm. or Y mm -hmm. situation? Um, and I, I think that if we move in that direction, I feel like that that feels more doable. So, Renee, I, I want to be able to hop on with that train of thought, but I do have something in the back of my head is, is that person of authority, at least for us as, as a person, always changes. So it's not always going to be that one person that's uh, the advisor or the authority on, on Turkey or Erdogan, for that matter. And, and using that as your pretext for an argument is also a fallacy to do so, just to appeal to authority because that person's the authority, they must know. So how do, it's not only just finding who's the authority or who's the expert that can at least help us frame our own opinions around that concept, but how do we track that over time as well? Mm-hmm. You know, just to take us 300 feet out, um, the general population uh, makes quick decisions about who authority is and who, who someone who, with the bullhorn generally becomes authority. I mean, we see this time and time again, the loudest person becomes the authority. And we know as academicians, we, we have to take a breath and, and, and look at that and say, that doesn't matter. And, and, and let's, let's look at the, the, pull the curtain away and find out what this person's made of. Um, next week, I'm going to San Francisco and I'm doing some more arresting knowledge work at, at, in, two, in two libraries and with new literacy people, people that are learning, that are, that are new readers. Um, and this is my old population, so I'm very comfortable with them, but these are people that are very highly motivated to understand the world around them and they have serious literacy issues, but they're civically highly engaged. It's a remarkable community. And for those people, there are the ABCs before the one, two, three. So, so I, I also want to just say, and kudos to everybody here, that we can drill down to such, such, so much complexity. But we have to remember that, you know, millions of people in this country um, are begging for leadership around the space of how do I just begin this conversation? So the compassion that we need to bring with us to this is that, we're very complimentary to each other. And I feel, I, I love that I'm in this conversation because I know so much less than most of you about who said what when in terms of the progression of this as a, as a, as a study, as, as an academic 
um, world. What I do know is how people learn it in community. So I love taking all this good stuff and bringing it into rooms and animating it and finding out how people respond. So um, I think, like Jared and I said in the beginning, we, we really want to make sure that we're partnered with not just teachers, but young students to help us bring this to the street literally so that every time somebody learns something we can say as leaders you know in june we're going to have an, a, an event at school and we want you to bring in your parents and we're going to do some really cool exercises to test out some of our theories about critical thinking and about um media uh the the, the, the six ways to look at a magazine or a television show and stuff like that and and get the kids to bring in parents to teach them so we can bring in this cyclical learning world that big fire with the with that kumbaya moment and it, and it really i wouldn't be saying this with such conviction had i not seen it myself this summer so, so you, um this is the intergenerational moment that you're you set us up for at the beginning of the hour is this the inter intergenerational moment you want us yes. to embrace i have a, i have a challenge for everybody on this, on this call which is to before before june 2018 um one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten of us total. If we can each individually create an environment, whether it's five people or ten people, where we have intergenerational people at the table and we we do one really fun. I mean, you guys have millions of exercises. I can't stop reading them. You guys have millions of things that you do that make something come alive. Um, if you want to animate the the idea that you know uh, tribe worthy is something you can look at, you can bring up one screen of tribe worthy and bring up one article and get it going. Get it going, like have them play with the buttons. Um, if you want to do some uh, just deep thinking around bias, um, I can give you tons of things on that. But can we have a thumbs up to see? Um, I know Zoe and Barbara can't do a thumbs up, but are you guys um, are you guys down with with this challenge? And we can really document it, and even if it's a small group, you know, it's it's. I mean, I know we're 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 working hard in our uh, daily jobs and i think for us it's sort of fun to to take off to get away from the head of the classroom and kind of be in a circle and just put it out there that this is a really cool chance to have um, group thinking and group learning so that you instead of having it like a workshop where you're standing in front you really literally make it a circle and you and you choose one thing um to do and uh it, it makes a big difference people get excited and empowered and then they bring it to their offices and to their Boy Scout clubs or their Rotary clubs or their churches. And, it, and, and movements begin this way. They begin with communication and, and relationships. So Deborah, we came like into the, the end of the, the hour of the webinar. And I wanted to, to ask you like two, three minutes ago about like a call for action and you just like did it. And also connecting with answering Rene to what um, Nikita posted like in the middle of the um, of the webinar, which was great to see that her work that she's doing with immigrants and refugees and asking for like resources as a young educator, um, like what would she do? And I think you just laid out kind of like of a plan and having us commit to it. And I think it's a beautiful closure to the whole discussion that we have. And obviously we didn't finish it and we're gonna keep um, working on it. Um, so I don't know if you and Jared, you have some closing words before we wrap up uh, this um, webinar um, to the viewers and the participants. Jared? I would first just like to say thank all of you guys for coming on to this webinar. Uh, it definitely means a lot to me as well as to Deborah. So I appreciate the feedback because that's what I do a lot in my daily life is just understand how we're all thinking about the issue because then we're better able to move forward from here. So thank you again. So again, thank you so much. Um, and we're gonna continue the conversation. Tomorrow we have a Twitter chat at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and in two weeks, we're gonna have a webinar uh, that I'll lead with uh, the new um, special issue on media literacy and disability. Mm -hmm. And that will conclude our uh, fall semester webinar. And we're going to continue in the spring uh, talking about those issues. So thank you very, very much for uh, participating. Thank you guys for including us.